Tonight we look a little bit to the east across the sea and we will be uh, looking at a remarkable case of a highly creative and original bottom-up initiative to, uh, to promote, uh, to conserve, to, to draw on the, the genius of a couple of languages of the Solomon Islands. And in connection with that, I'd like to extend a special welcome to Acting Ambassador Helen Beck of the Solomon Islands. Welcome, we're very glad uh, that you could be here, and to other family members who are also here tonight. So it's my great honour and pleasure to introduce tonight Dr. Alpheus Graham Zobule, and he uh, was born in Vonunu in 1969 and has had a, a fascinating career that started out uh, with first year science studies at the University of South Pacific in Fiji in the late 80s and then turned into a science degree at the University of Kansas uh, graduating in 1991 as a Fulbright scholar. After that, he went on to the Dallas Theological Seminary in, in the USA, where he took a master's in biblical exegesis and linguistics, and somewhat later, moving to Singapore and to Trinity Theological College, took a master's in theology, again focusing on biblical exegesis and translation. And then, sometime after that, in 2008, uh, Alpheus obtained his PhD at the Union Theological Seminary and Presbyterian School of Christian Education in Richmond in the USA with a major on Old Testament studies. Among the list of languages that Alpheus uh, lists as, as languages he knows, that therefore should not surprise you that it includes Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, Latin, Ugaritic, Northwest Semitic inscriptions, in addition to English, German, French, Solomon's Pigeon, Roviana, Simbu, Kubokota, uh, and Lunga. So these are all languages that are brought together and that have led to uh, an incredibly original and creative series of developments which we will hear about tonight. I don't want to waste your time saying things a quarter as well as Alpheus would say them himself. So without further ado, welcome Alpheus and I hand the floor over. Good, good evening everyone. All right, uh, I'd like to start by asking you to imagine uh, that you have uh, received some basic training in linguistics and you are sent out there to help a people group uh, and the assigned task you have been given is to study the language and to write a book for them and you take it upon yourself uh, to do it and within a year you come up with a book and at the launch of the book uh, you realize to your disappointment that the people you have been writing for do not know how to read the book. Uh, to make it more uh, from uh, so much a disappointment, uh, it is, uh, you are actually one of them, part of the people. You know, you're supposed to know in the first place, but uh, that's the case. Uh, that is how, what I'm going to talk to you about started way back almost uh, 20 years uh, ago. The topic for tonight's presentation is studying the vernacular in the vernacular by the vernacular speakers. And this is the case of the Kulu Language Institute in the Solomon Islands. This is the Solomon Islands. And the work we've been doing uh, takes place. Uh, there is a small island just off uh, Giza. It's not actually Giza, it's Ranonga. And that's where the story began uh, 20 years ago. Uh, the island, uh, there are two languages on the island, two dialects very similar to each other. The northern uh, dialect is called the Kumbokota, 
and the southern is called Lunga. Uh, much of what I'm going to talk to you about this evening uh, is on the Lunga language, but they are close enough so that uh, people who speak Kumbakota can understand Lunga, although there are differences. Uh, both speakers of both languages can understand each other uh, quite well. Uh, Kulu stands for, uh, it's an abbreviation for the two uh, d languages. Ku is for Kumbakota and Lu is for Lunga. And it started out as an individual effort, later uh, as a small group effort, and now has become a, uh, an organized, form, semi-formalized kind of an uh, 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 organization. It's now called a Kulu Language Institute. It's a, a community language movement. I call it a community language movement because the community are very much part of this. They are very much involved uh, in doing what I'm uh, going to talk uh, to you about this uh, evening. In the beginning years, way back in the 1997, 2000, those uh, first five years, um, I went out there as a Bible translator and uh, I started to work on Lunga, translating the Bible into that language. And within a year, I uh, worked with, of course, with a, a group of uh, speakers from the language, and I'm a native speaker of the language myself. But I got some help from uh, a few of them, and within a year, we were able to try to publish the Gospel of Mark. And the idea was to get that publication out so that people would start reading it and start uh, uh, be able to see what we have done. Uh, we have done uh, as a, a trial publication. Uh, immediately after we published that, we realized that uh, uh, we should have known this, but uh, we didn't know for the reason that uh, there had been no book in the language. This was the first book we published. And we had thought that uh, people uh, had been able to read English, and many of them had been able to read English, so that shouldn't be a problem reading Lunga. That's what we thought. But we realized that not many people uh, were able to read uh, Lunga. And so uh, we had to kind of uh, do something different. And although translation was really the main uh, task, uh, we decided we had to teach people to read their own language. And so we started with a small community. And that community happened to be my own community. I grew up with that community. And I, I knew that community very well. Uh, the only few educated ones from that community, uh, less than four. And I am the only one who, uh, up until now, has been educated to the level uh, that I have been. Uh, but for my, m most of them, uh, it's very basic education. Uh, we started, we wanted to teach them how to read Lunga. And so, <coughs> When we did that, then it kind of took a life of its own, and we, still, we were still doing Bible translation, but we thought it was important to focus on teaching the people how to read their own language. And it was very interesting, because uh, people did not really believe that our language was good enough. Good enough in a sense that there, people believe, okay, English is a language that everyone has been using to say that uh, Lunga has a grammar, that's kind of very strange. Uh, to be able to study it, that's not something people even thought of would be possible. So there were people who were interested in what we were doing. Many of them were very curious. Uh, when, we, when I showed them that uh, Lunga had grammar, some of them were very surprised. And uh, even they did not even believe uh, that uh, what we were doing was maybe even the right thing to do. And uh, it was not really uh, something they really welcomed in the first place. Uh, but we continued and uh, we organized workshops, uh, got people to come and study the language. I actually studied that right, the grammar of the language in the language uh, and we started to call in people who were interested. Uh, the many challenges were we didn't have materials, uh, class materials, uh, reading materials, because there were none. Uh, we needed places to run workshops. 
uh, there was the issue of finance, and no teachers were available. But I think the most difficult one was really the last one, that people, the people's attitude toward the language, their own language. It was very negative. Uh, they did not believe our language was good enough. Uh, and because they, they thought it wasn't good enough, they didn't think it was really necessary to do anything uh, to write the grammar or to teach people to read it. So that was, real, that was the most uh, difficult thing. Uh, a lot of uh, the success we, are, uh, we have now, 20 years later, really uh, it's to the credit of people like this. Th these are three I call pioneers who were really committed to doing it and running workshops, working with me to teach people, those who were interested in studying the language. Uh, these three people uh, were key in the first, uh, during the first uh, few years of, of our work. After a while, people was, became interested, gradually became interested in studying the language. Uh, they saw something different. They, they came to learn the language and they discovered things were different. Uh, and they began to change uh, their way of uh, thinking about their own language and their attitudes toward their own language. So all of a sudden, people was, they were interested. So uh, churches became classrooms for us. Uh, any space that was available uh, was a classroom. Uh, and when there were no houses, uh, classrooms were held at the tents. Uh, any building that looked like it was a good one to run a class in, uh, we used it. Uh, now it's really very much uh, dependent on people's interest. And uh, we went from uh, a village to another village running workshops. But it was slow in the first place. But things gradually uh, gained uh, momentum. And uh, uh, school students came to attend our uh, courses. And later on, people came in numbers. And uh, school teachers, things began to be more uh, of something that not, e even the educated people uh, became interested in doing. And so even secondary school teachers, primary school teachers were interested. This is something, it's, it's quite new because uh, all, every, all along it has been uh, English. The language of instruction in the Solomon Islands is English. We have about 70 languages. And for practical reasons, it's just impossible to teach all the other 70 languages. So uh, English became the, the language. Uh, but uh, now uh, we have so many people coming. Uh, this is as recent as uh, uh, two weeks ago. We have an, about a group of about 40 of them uh, graduating, having done uh, the, uh, the four required courses that uh, that we, we run. At some point during the first 10 years, uh, there was a chief who thought that what we were doing was important enough. And so he decided to donate a two hectare piece of land. Uh, and he said, build your school on this uh, land and do whatever you want to do uh, to help people uh, learn their own language. And that's what we did. Occasionally, a member of parliament, this is actually a parliament member, uh, would help us with something uh, to encourage us uh, to keep doing what uh, we're doing. Uh, and gradually, the community became involved, uh, mostly volunteers, uh, to help us build uh, uh, houses. And right now, we have something that looks like uh, a school. Uh, and we have um, classrooms and teachers uh, using those to teach uh, classes. All right, that summary of what we have done from the very beginning, in the first five years, it, it was almost one workshop per year. Uh, in the 1997, 2002, uh, that's, it's like one workshop per year uh, for 129 participants. In the second five year, it's uh, still the same, uh, with numbers slightly increasing. The third uh, 
five years, it increased to about 24 workshops for every five years. That's, that's about four or five workshops per year. And during the last five years, uh, there has been now so much interest uh, within the last uh, five years, but mostly the last three years, we, we've been running so many workshops. And right, right now while I'm speaking, there are about two or three groups. Uh, and so it's, counting, it's more than 100 plus in the last five years. Within, actually, within the last three years, uh, things have really gone uh, up. Okay, the, there are some observations. Uh, before we started doing this, People did not really think much of their own uh, vernacular. Uh, but things have really changed now. Uh, to the people of Kumbakota and Lunga, their own language is now very important. And communities are getting involved in uh, hosting workshops or helping to organize. Uh, the vernacular speakers are coming in numbers. Uh, we have more than a hundred, more than a thousand stories of what they have done, uh, and other non-Lunga speakers, but who know those those who know Lunga, uh, are coming. The neighboring islands, especially, and a big shift in the way it, people think about their own language. That's probably the biggest difference that I've seen uh, during the last 20 years. What do we do? Uh, why do people come to study? For a number of reasons. Uh, we started out trying to help people to read the Bible, so that, that is a reason why people come to study their own language. But uh, for many, it's really just wanting to study the language so that they make sense of life. Others want to know how to analyze words because that's what we do. And others, they they think that if you learn the vernacular, that will help you to be able to read English. And some even think that uh, they will get better qualification, uh, or education. Uh, people come for a number of reasons. For us, it's really, uh, and even some people think uh, they'll come to get uh, qualification to get good employment. We do not offer any employment, but that's what people think. Really our purpose is to teach people to be able to read the language. And that, I think that's what we, we do when we teach people to, re to read the language. We teach language, it is for the purpose of helping people to read the language. So that, is, that remains our purpose. Uh, we have this model, all read well, so we kind of want people to, to be able to read. We help them to read. Now. Reading to a reading, people who come from a reading culture. Uh, this is the way I look at reading. Reading involves a reader's meaningful interaction with the written text that composes a word. So you read, it meant, what it means is you have a text that is written by somebody or maybe by yourself. And when you read, you are interacting with the text, words in the text. Out of that interaction, you have meaning. So it's a meaningful interaction. But that's the kind of concept you have if you come from a reading culture. What about if you come from a non-writing, non-reading culture? What is reading? That, this is the case of the Kulu people. The first book we wrote was that Gospel of Mark. Before that, there was really no concept of reading in the, in the sense that uh, I have just mentioned about. So reading, let me focus on the, that word. The word we use for reading is tiro. Tiro has uh, a number of components in meaning. It's, it's the word that is used when you are looking down from a higher place, elevation, you're looking down and you're looking and looking for something. You're searching for something that is hidden or covered, and you're looking uh, with the purpose to uncover, to identify, to try to find out what it is. How is this different from the other things? And with the intention of eventually to pick something. 
And usually when you do that, you pick things one by one, individually. <laughs> it, is a, it is very hard work, it's slow, and uh, involves a lot of hard work, and it requires patience and commitment and endurance. A, people, a person who gives up easily will not, be, will not enjoy this kind of work. That's the kind of word we use when a mother or a little girl, or maybe a man or a boy, they go out to look for nuts. They have to uh, uncover the nuts, look under leaves and litters, and uh, go into the bushes and look. They're small nuts, so it takes a lot of time and effort. That is also the same word when a fisherman uh, stays out on land and looks out into the horizon, into the sea, and looks for birds that go down. There's got to be a tuna somewhere out there. And he looks out there, and when he's sure that uh, he can go and get a catch, he will uh, paddle out to sea. That is also the same word that a, a bird does when the bird flies in the sky and looks down at things, and even looks down to get a catch. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a view that one gets from a higher point of uh, elevation, looking down and trying to have, uh, observe things, have a better view of, of things. That's the word. That is the metaphor we use in talking about reading. So what is reading then in Kulu? It's the idea of reading a written text is foreign to begin with. It's looking for something. It's looking for something hidden. So searching to uncover information that is somehow covered. And now that we apply this concept to reading a text, something is, is covered in the language. And we're trying to uncover that by reading, as we say, tiro in the language. So for a Lunga speaker or Kumbokota speaker, reading involves identifying the parts of the language, searching for the nuts, the fish, the catch. Something is there hidden, waiting to be caught, waiting to be found, waiting to be discovered. And when a person thinks about them and talks about them and actually sees them, then we can say that person understands. But it involves looking for them. So that's the concept behind what we say read, when we say read in Kulu. What is it that we look for? Uh, when we look at the language, we know the nuts when we go looking for them. But when you read a text, what is it that you look for? This is where we think uh, there's got to be something they look for. So this means describing the language so that they go looking for the things. And so it became necessary that we had to choose a language of description and also words to describe concepts and then have the reader go looking for those things. So this is how we started in the first place. That's the first five years. I used whatever I knew of English grammar and started at very basic. So an alphabet, as said in Lunga, that's alphabet. A consonant is a consonant, and a vowel is a vowel, basically said in the way Lunga speakers say. We did this, and we started teaching the first group that I mentioned, the Saibuki people. It didn't take uh, too long for us to find out that that was very bad. It was not a good idea at all. Because when we started talking about, well, alphabet, I think it was not a problem. But when we start talking about consonant, said in the Lunga way, people was, they were very confused. When we started talking about vowel, they didn't know what it was. So we spent time just trying to explain what these words meant and not really learning what we wanted them to learn. Uh, syllable, for example, noun, verb, adjective, all those good words. So we decided 
that we need to come with a, a different system. This is no good. <clears throat> so we decided to start naming the alphabets the way we thought would, they would understand. The alphabet letters, the letters, we have, we have to give names to them. So the first one is an R, the second is a Ba, the D is a Da, the E, and Ga, and E, and Ja. So that's our Abada, which is our alphabet. We teach them to say this. It's Abada, Ega, Ijakala, Mananganya, Opagarasta, Ubaza. That's the alphabet. We had fun doing this. The first time we did this, it sounded very funny. And, but they liked it. So we had to teach them. So then A is an A, B is a Ba, D is a Da, and A is A, and G is a, actually the G is a Ga. And we taught them that whole thing. Starting at the very basic, uh, uh, starting with the, the letters, but then the next thing is to describe the, the sound concepts. And to do this, we resorted to relationship terms. So it's something that we thought people would understand, basically. We tried, we tried to come up with something that people would use to be able to describe the language. So a sound is this, that's the basic thing we want to describe. And the second column, that's the equivalent in Lunga. And then the third column is the back translation of the Lunga, just for your interest. Uh, the second column is what we used. So a sound is an ovovere, which basically means something like a sound or voice or noise. A consonant. Uh, an unused consonant is a ovovelare echo, which means it's a female sound. When a consonant is used in a word, then it's a tin and a letter, which means it's a mother letter. An unused vowel is a ovovele komburu, simply means it's a, it's a young child letter. But when it's used in a word, then it's a tuni letter, which means a child letter. It has a mother somehow. When two vowels are put together, then you have, a, you have a twin. So it's a twin child, twin letter. A syllable is a piece of uh, sound. And when you put the two sounds, consonant and vowel syllables, then it's a tamatina letter, which is the mother-child sound, or mother-child letter. And a V, or vowel syllable, that is a street-born child, which means it doesn't have a mother. They, that's the way they say it uh, in the language. Okay, so this is really just to help us talk about the sounds, the letters, the consonants, and everything. Because when we started teaching them the words, they want to know what that is. You have to have a name for it. So we gave them names. So, so that is uh, the consonants are mother letters, and the vowels are child letters. And uh, the syllables with the consonant, the vowels, that's a mother-child letter. And then or when you put all that together, then you have a, a, a piece word, which means that's a word. Yeah. We have to name uh, word concepts before we started talking about them. And for a lot of them, uh, we used uh, plant terms. It's just something that makes sense to them. Uh, something, how do, you, how do you describe meaning? Meaning is a very nice word, but we, we never talked about meaning, I mean, in the language. And so we had to t take something that they, we think that will make sense to them. So we use the word content. In some ways, it may mean fruit, the fruit of something, or the content of something. Vagiso. Uh, the word is a peace word. Uh, a word that has meaning is a kombu paranga vagiso. Vagiso is mean it's, it's, uh, it has content. And the word that is meaningless is uh, the word that doesn't have meaning. So it's, uh, doesn't have, it's a piece of word with no content. 
And then describing the words, starting with the stem or the, the core of the word. Uh, it's the core piece word. And then give names to the suffixes and affixes, just to be able to talk about them. So there are front suffixes, there are end suffixes, front attachment or end attachment, and the middle uh, affixes. And when uh, the same syllable is repeated, it's something like twice study. Okay? Um, that helps us to be able to talk about them. All this sounded very funny to the people. We had never talked like that before. This is all new. But to be able to talk about the words, we had to do it. So we can then say, OK, these are two words. Kokobo, there's no word in Lunga language. So that is a word that has meaning. It doesn't, does not have meaning. It's kombu paran keporivagiso. Kokombu is a word that has meaning. So that's a meaningful word, meaning, meaningful peace word. That also helps us to be able to talk about uh, words that have so many morphemes, parts to it. So this is a word in Lunga. <coughs> and if you break those into small parts and morphemes, then you come with things like this. Uh, the core part of the word is that. And then you have pieces attached to it to come up with this word, which means the word is Waibagigalainaria. Each and every part of, contributes an aspect of meaning to the word. But to be able to talk about those, you have to kind of separate them and give names to them. And so that's what we did. And then now we can say, OK, that group, that's Pasusumomai, means that front attached, attachment. And the Kolangaparanga, that's the core of the word. And then you have the pasus kokoraba is the middle part uh, attachment. And then the pasus bebeto, the suffix, that's the end attachment. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, when people think of pasusu, they think of a tree that has branches. And so the stem, and then you have the branches. So when you talk about those, they can actually imagine uh, when they talk about the word. In using, uh, naming the parts of speech, uh, relationship terms, uh, they're helpful. But a lot of times, uh, we have to be very descriptive in the way we uh, name them. So a noun is nisong, which means name. It's a name. A verb is an act. An adjective, an adjective usually goes with a noun. So it's a relative of a name. An adverb normally goes with a verb, so it's a relative of an act. And a pronoun, it's a, it's, it's a word that uh, means something like it's a distant relative of a name. Uh, it stands for noun, something. These, and these now become useful in talking, referring to words, discussing words. And that's what we use. And at the phrase and clause level, uh, again, still using words that uh, uh, we thought it would make sense to the people, uh, using food, body, plant terms. Uh, the a phrase is a, a one unit word, group of words. Uh, and you have a zero phrase of phrases that uh, somehow group together and they work as a unit. Uh, it's a group, group uh, one unit word. Uh, and then you have markers, uh, determiners, or words that they uh, the small words sometimes, they bring in something, some aspect of meaning. Uh, they are markers, and we have a lot of those. And, uh, and the clauses, pakata uh, parangam, which is the cut word, words that somehow they group together, and you have to move, they move them together. Uh, you cannot just separate them. They work almost an, as an unit. And the basic clause is the core of that group. And when you, because we have serial verb systems, uh, it's uh, we, the word teteri is, is a word that a fisherman uses when he goes for, he brings back his catch, and then he puts the fish on a string, all of that, to, uh, strings them. And that's the word we use. All that is something that people can imagine. And uh, it's verbs stringed together. 
and you have a, a, a string basic clause or verbs. Okay. So uh, this, is, this is an example of, uh, of analyzing a phrase or clause. Mostly as a phrase. This is a sentence in Lunga, in John Isabago and Asura. I've colored them, color coded them so that the red, that is a, is, is a phrase. Uh, the green is again a phrase, and then you have Nasura as a phrase. You can reorder them in any order, and it still maintain the basic meaning. And basically, you can reorder them in six different ways. And it's still meaningful, still carries the same basic meaning. Uh, the difference will be uh, the word, usually the word that is front, the phrase that is fronted is given emphasis. But otherwise, the basic meaning is, is the same. But the point of here is those words, like e John, for example, they move together when they move from one point place to another. Uh, in naming the parts of sentence, uh, we use descriptive terms that describes the function of, uh, uh, so the sentence is, is, a, is a complete word or complete talk. A subject is the main thing, so it's at the bottom or the main uh, part of the sentence. Uh, the verb is act, as I uh, said earlier on. So a longer speaker is able to analyze the sentence and talk about it. In Jone, that's the kuta, sabagwa, that's the roiti, and uh, nasura, like a direct object, that's the uli soso, that's a direct, uh, direct, uh, direct touch, basically. Yeah. There are so many words that do not neatly fit under those usual eight categories of parts of speech, and we have to give names to them to be able to discuss. So a lot of markers, for example, uh, and we, we name those uh, mostly describing what they do. So permanent markers, that's not uh, the pen that you use to write on with. It's really uh, markers that they, are, they really are affixed to what they, the word they go with. So it's a fixed marker. Gila uh, togasa. And there are markers that indicate humans, uh, the human marker or person marker, and uh, those that indicate something, gila uh, sakasa, and those that indicate a place or location. Uh, every one of those has to be given a name uh, before we talk about those. There are ones, certain ones that are movable. Uh, they can be moved depending on what the speaker wants to say, maybe emphasize or focus on. So, and they are also named uh, based on what they do as well, basically describing their function. So, this is, these are examples, these are not all of them. Uh, there are certain markers that are fixed to the word they go with. So, e sa na, for example, in the sentence, e jone sabago na sura, the ones that are underlined are markers, they mark like e, for example, marks, that's a person marker. So you cannot use that with a coconut, for example. You cannot say e sura. That does not make sense. It has to go with the, the name of a person. So e jone, sa bagua, nasura. E goes with jone, sa goes with bagua, and na, so they, they're fixed to the word they go with. If you try to move those, then uh, meaning breaks down. The movable one, an example is two, for example. Two is movable. It can be moved from place to place, depend, uh, from, go to an, uh, whichever phrase you want to modify. So, it can go with two. Jone two, sambago and asura. But you can also move that to go with the next phrase. It jone sambago two, nasura. You can also move it to the last one. And each time, it's different. The meaning is diff slightly different. The basic meaning of the sentence remains the same, but there is certain, uh, uh, aspect of meaning that is brought in there to add to, th that makes it a little different. Yeah. Then we have a number of those. Okay. The pronoun system is probably the complex, most complex. Uh, again, because you, pronouns usually, a lot of them refer to humans, so the relationship terms are very helpful. Uh, but also describing what they do. So there is the Turana Nisan for example, the first group. Those are usually referred to, 
persons. So uh, I can, ara means I, and I name myself. Or I can point to age, and we have the inclusive and the exclusive kind of reference in the first uh, person plural. And, but that's person. And if I want to express something uh, to talk about uh, ownership or something that I own, I could use the, the other group, number three. And uh, then you see the other groups there. They are different. Uh, to be able to talk about them, we have to name them and give name, names that are descriptive so that we can refer to those. And then there is another one. Usually that's, that involves food. Okay. The other, and probably the most difficult of them, is this. And this, uh, for those of you who talk about realist, irrealist, that would be maybe something that comes in. But I, I prefer not to use those because uh, I don't want, I, it's, I have to kind of think through this in Lunga, rather than using a different category and impose on it. So what we do here is, is trying to use descriptive words in the language and try to explain what it says. So um, there is a lot of those. Uh, those uh, indicate the kind of, the way a speaker views the occurrence of a word, uh, an action, for example. So an action that uh, uh, is a def when it views as a definite occurrence, Sagore uh, Wotu, as one, two, three, four, the fourth. And basically it says, it occurs. If, uh, if, uh, it's, if an action is viewed as something that is definitely going to occur, but it has not occurred, then it's uh, will definite occurrence. Minagore Wotu, will occur. That means the speaker knows or is certain will happen. That doesn't, that's not to say that it will happen, but in the view of the speaker, uh, uh, he or she uh, thinks definitely, definite about it. Uh, about indefinite occurrence, mi uh, gorewotu. That's almost like something that is intending. An intention is involved, uh, and would be unrealized occurrence. That is almost like the desire is there. It's unrealized occurrence. And then the last one. It's the ideal, unrealized occurrence. Uh, ideal, it's the most ideal situation. I have 10 minutes left, thank you. Uh, but it does not necessarily occur. So uh, different ways of looking at it. And these are grouped, again, the different ways of, they, they come, usually come before a verb to tell you what kind of uh, event occurrence uh, a speaker thinks about. And these are, uh, again, uh, uh, described using uh, descriptive terms. Uh, trying to put it in kind of a, uh, this is the way it is, the whole system. Uh, at the very center, that's the ideal. Uh, the ideal occurrence. That is the ideal, that's the, the proper thing. That, that, but not necessarily, when it, when it actually occurs, it doesn't mean it will occur the way it is. But that's the, that's the ideal. Um, okay, so basically uh, we have come up with uh, ways to describe the language starting from the sound to the sentence and also I do not have time to talk about this uh, it, when we talk about a complete writing uh, and I have not discussed anything uh, involving this but uh, uh, by the way I have books here at the end of the presentation if you want to have a look at them. Uh, you can come and maybe uh, have a look. Let me uh, close. One of the things we do, because uh, it, the, the, the attitude of the people toward their own language, that was the most difficult, I said earlier on. One of the ways we try to kind of make people think about the importance of the language is to try to talk, use metaphors. And in every one of those, uh, at the end of every chapter, there is what we call the food for thought. And that uses a simple story that highlights the importance of a word, language, or reading. Uh, it's really metaphors. And it uses, in, in many of those, and most, I think almost all of them, 
they try to use the meta language to explain what it is so that you make the connection between real reality and the meta language so that people kind of understand what it is we try to talk about. This is an example uh, when we try to emphasize, try to talk about the mother-child letter using the metaphor of the mother-child. Let me just read it very quickly. Now, Tamatina, the words that I put in uh, bold are the words, new words that we are using come from the relationship and we're now using it to speak of gra grammar. That natamatina sakai parang sa ulo nene skarotina ni, karotina ni iras natina na bed natuna, ira karuai pira sa gaita gigal natamatina. Kada kami na call na kumbru, pon sa natina sa mina call atu. Na owa walang basa call na natina na bed natuna. Toto na ingay maker ay roiti sa ira karuai pira pon sa roiti na ira karus na, ay roiti na ira karus na owa walang tamatina. Kog natamatina sa sa tambata pon at pon ato atina ni. But upon uh, overland and overland. Tone mu natiro, pon mu doroko pon reiranland. Basically tells them going from the human relationship to the relationship between a consonant and a vowel. And it's fun reading for longer people. Basically it's what it says, uh, that the mother child speaks of two persons. And so then uh, when you talk about a syllable involving a consonant and a vowel, then it's two things. One is a mother, one is a child. Okay, uh, we have a lot of this. The reason why I bring this up is because this has done a lot to kind of make people think about their own language, the importance of the language, and to be able to appreciate that you can actually use your language to talk about things. Uh, the last one, uh, I'd like to use this and then I'll close. Uh, this uses the word place on the word tiro, which is the word for reading. And reading, we've said what it is, but uh, this is what it says. If you do not know, I, I'll give you the, the translation. If you do not know, then read. If your mind is cluttered, then read. If you're confused about it, then read. If you, if you want to know, then read. If you have already known, then read. Reading will give you wings. Now it, it plays on the meaning of reading, which is something that you do from up there somewhere and looking down, and it will soar the sky high and you will be reading for yourself. Okay. And uh, place of the meaning of that. Now, what it is that has sustained this for the last 20 years? With little funding, it is the community who are doing this and the people are studying their language in their own language. I think uh, basically reading raises a person to a higher elevation. That's the way I think I've seen it. And it helps them to search for knowledge. It gives them understanding when they see it. And empowers them with the critical ability to think about what they, they read and what they see. It gives them the ability to examine things that I think previously they did not have. And gives them the opportunity to reflect on life. This I think the things not necessarily money that has sustained this. It is people discovering something that has given them some certain abilities to be able to do things that, uh, that they were ne not able to do before. So the question now is, what next? Well, if we are to keep reading Tiro in the coolest sense of the word, then we must keep searching under leaves and litter for nuts looking out to the horizon for tuna, searching or uh, soaring the sky and looking down for the catch, for it is in reading that we hope to get a better view of the world around and beyond us. Thank you. Thank you, Alphys, for a magnificent talk. Uh, we have some time for discussion yet, so the floor is open. Please raise your hand and perhaps say your name and, and where you come from so that we can get to know each other a bit better in the process. Uh, we've got one microphone going around.
Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you for your talk. Um, maybe a strange first question. I'm wondering about writing. Um, is there many people writing now in um, their language and then they need a word to read? Is that something that the Institute is looking at um, teaching as well? Sorry, I didn't catch that question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, are people uh, writing in their language now as well, now that they have learned to read? Are they, are they, are they writing? Yes. It's part of our uh, training that they have to produce writing. And so we have about more than a thousand pieces of small writing that the students produce. And we type those out. And then you, what we do is we type them and reproduce them as reading materials uh, for those who come later. study needs to be done first to see you know what the, the, the structure of the other languages and how they behave before we can maybe consider doing something that we can apply to the other languages so uh, this is just for Lunga uh, and still working on it Thank you very much, first of all, for providing such a beautiful, creative, metaphorical approach to reading, which has just been gorgeous. <laughs> but the question, the sort of similarity with many other contexts is that it's adults working in Bible study and vernacular literacy through reading the Bible, which is something that we've seen in similar contexts all around the world. But the question that I have is, Beyond Bible reading now, what are people reading? What are people using this reading for beyond that original intention? Yeah. Beyond that, I think it's mostly it's what we produce, the books we produce, and writings the students themselves produce. Uh, there's nothing more now, but those who are able to read English, they go on and read other things. of 
of uh, what I'm trying to describe. That's the first thing. Uh, so I think more training would be better. But also helping more national speakers to be able to do this, that would be another good thing to do. I forget this first, the other question that you asked. Uh, well, it was basically uh, what could be done to basically to encourage native speakers of endangered languages to be involved in this kind of work. Yes. I think just letting them know that they can do it. I have try, I have done a, I've gotten a group together, those that I know, and we try to do very basic things now. And they're starting to realize that this is possible. I think that's the first thing. Uh, I think more of that needs to be done. Uh, and in involving other speakers of other languages. And when I talked about institutional support, they meant maybe funding, Encouragement. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I think which? Uh, yes, thank you very much for that. Uh, I was wondering, um, as others have kind of suggested, are there similar projects elsewhere in the world that haven't been quite as successful as this one? We had this sudden uh, surge and met people coming to our workshops. So I was wondering if you had any ideas about what might have caused this really sudden rose on the table you showed. So a really sudden surge in people who uh, were coming to your workshop, your workshop who were uh, running. A sudden surge from almost like... Yeah, so it was, I think you showed us a pretty steady kind of like workshop and then suddenly like, bam, like a hundred, like all of a sudden. So I was wondering if you knew what caused that surge. One, one of the things is when people, especially the younger people coming to attend this, they go on to do their secondary school education, they actually do better than the others. And so the only conclusion that others make of that is that because they have taken classes with us, so then now they go around and tell people, let's go take classes, go take classes. So, so it's mostly them going out and telling people to come. I think that's one of the things. But also the other thing I think, is it really has helped people to be able to talk about ideas things they were not able to do before. Uh, even in not school, but even outside, they can discuss and talk about it. And very analytical kind of discussion. That's great, thank you. Hello, thank you very much. I'm Heather from ANU. Um, I went to a workshop recently um, where anthropologists were talking about um, making Christianity and biblical texts into a um, metaphor that makes more sense for people in other places. There's a lot of things that are weird in the Bible. They're in the desert, there's camels, you know, there's it's all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and a lot of people in, in uh, Polynesia, at least, um, remake those metaphors into things to do more with um, environments that they're more familiar with. And therefore the stories come to life in a different way. Uh, and they also are able to read different things into the text that people haven't before. And I was wondering if your project with um, with uh, Luca had 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 any any fruits like that. Or is that that's not maybe this is the theory. No, no, just, yeah, just need to rephrase the question a little. I... Um. So when you read, because you know uh, Aramaic, Greek. Hebrew, um, Hebrew and English, and when you read your Google text and when you interpret them into these languages, yeah. do you find that there are other interpretations that you have because of that language? Is there other meanings that you're reading into the stories? Does that make sense? Uh, okay. <laughs> no, maybe not. It doesn't, never mind, that's okay. Uh, I think many, many times going directly from the Greek and Hebrew is much easier for me than going through the English translation. <laughs> English is great. Uh, many times I think that a, the, a lot of meaning, meaning is concealed in the translation, English translation. Mm -hmm. It's better for me to just leave that English translation and go direct to the language. Mm -hmm. Many times the structure is much better. Uh, and uh, even the, a lot of the idioms that I think they can be brought across directly, when they go through English, they kind of lose something. Oh, okay, so, yeah. They're very fortunate to have you then, that but, they don't have to go directly from English. Yeah, but, but I, I, translation is translation. Uh, languages are never the same. No, no two languages are the same, so uh, I 
there are things that it's also not possible to, to bring across directly. Yeah. Okay. Hi, yeah, uh, my name is Ian Sales. I think I'm still a visiting fellow. What a fan you here. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, I should just say that I've been working for quite a while on, on Duke Air language, which is quite close to Renonga. It's yeah. just on an uh, island not very far away, as you know. Um, I've got a lot of questions for you, but can I, could I ask you four? Do you think you can keep them on the show? Okay. <laughs> just to, you know, I've got yeah. a microphone. Um, so, uh, first off, um, I've sort of noticed you haven't talked much about the, the sort of the, 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 uh, the language industry context that does exist in Solomon Islands. So, for example, um, how has been the response of the Ministry of Education? You know, they've got that, that primary school Indigenous language program that they, they're hoping to roll out. It seems to not be progressing very quickly, but it's there. You know, I mean, you, you've, you've touched on people being interested at the high school level. So, so what about primary school? So that's question number one. Another, another language context. Um, in in Kolomangara, Duke language, one of the great difficulties is that uh, since, let's say, 1970, there's been an increasing number of intermarriages to quite far away parts of Solomon Islands. And those people don't quickly pick up Duque. So pigeon has become very common in villages and young children, unless parents are quite um, vigilant or, or strict or committed, those young children just speak pigeon. That's, that's their first language. Um, Katie, let's um, take those two questions first of all, the memory loads going to you. So, 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 so what, about, what about the impact of pigeon on, on what you're doing? So okay. Okay, those two things. Okay, so the first, the Ministry of Education. This is the probably the, uh, up to a, a certain point, maybe early this year, it's I think the least known literacy program in the Solomon Islands, uh, least known by the Ministry of Education. Uh, early this year, um, I had the opportunity and because Deborah came, and we had the opportunity to go and sit down with, uh, sat down with uh, people from the Ministry of Education and talk to them about it. And, and they were interested, and the Ministry of Education has policy, uh, the vernacular policy that has not been uh, implemented uh, for practical reasons. It's just not possible, 70 by the Ministry of but but it's there. This is really not the kind of the children's literacy, at least adult. But we are also taking in anybody who, uh, younger people who come in. So, uh, the last C does not cover this, I don't think. They focus more on Pigeon, uh, Literacy Association of Solomon Islands. So, it would be interesting uh, to see what they think, but uh, this is making some impact. So, the other one, people going directly to Pigeon as their first language. They do get people, right? Okay. Uh, for Ranonga people, Dunga people, uh, that, would, that would be true for those who live in Onera. Uh, they grow up, uh, Pidgin becomes the, almost the first language. But for those out there in the rural area, I think Lunga is still the first. Yeah. Well, Mike, hold your other two questions uh, and give others a go, and then come back to you if you have time to so that everyone gets a fair, uh, fair go. Thank you. Uh, I'm Daniel from the University of Melbourne. So I, I think we can answer. So my question is about um, have you ever encountered sentiments about, like you mentioned that people, the people's motivation of attending this kind of reading uh, lessons and workshop is one of the like, getting more knowledge and getting more understanding of the world and have, have been any, contact, any 
sentiments about since we are reading, why don't we just read English or other major languages? Because I think if we want to apply this model to other endangered languages, uh, it's very likely that there is the presence of a stronger language. So since the people are just going to learn to read, why are there many people who are asking, why don't we just learn to read a, a stronger language? And what, how do we respond to that kind of sentiment? So, if I've understood the question, it is whether you've encountered a response from people that if you're going to be learning reading, why not to yeah. go straight into the more um, strong language that is, that is English, and why not go straight into that? You you mean that I do not have to teach them Lunga? Have any people said that? Really encounter this kind of sentiment among the, 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 the good people, the people of sort of minds. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you handled that earlier in the talk, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. get better in English school if they do not get to this. So is that what you think whether um, people have been resistant to learning? Oh, well, initially, yes, of course. In, initially, people were very resistant. They didn't want it. Actually, they had a very negative view of our own language. They thought English was the better language. So that people should just go straight to English and study English. Um, that, was, that was initially. They no longer think that now. Maybe it's still 5% think that, but um, now they think their language is is as important as English. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mohammed from UNSW. I've got okay. some questions because. Uh, okay. I'm coming from UNSW because my background is in teaching, teaching version. I've been teaching for four years. And that was a second language of foreign language. I used to teach Persian to foreigners. I wanted to just double check with you. Did you start teaching with teaching grammar and linguistic terminology? You said you work on some terminology like phrases or clause, and you taught them to, to adults, yeah? Those who speak the language. Did you start I just started with, teaching English grammar. Is that a question? No, no, the grammar of your language. Yeah, I, I'm afraid I didn't quite understand your question. Could you rephrase it? Okay. A bit more clearly? I mean, uh, how was your syllabus design in teaching your language? Can you talk about your syllabus design? What did you include in your in your lessons? And so did you work on just reading, or just reading and grammar? Are skills in your in your book? This is really grammar. Just grammar. Yeah. Analyzing the language, the grammar, the syntax of the language, and then readings uh, a part of it. Writing stories, that's part of it. Yeah. The, basically, the first one is really an, an alphabet kind of thing. And then moves on to teaching people to, to read and write and be able to have confidence in doing it. And then the, the second book is really uh, a grammar that focuses on the word level, word level grammar. And then the other one moves on to the sentence grammar. And the final one is the more complete writing kind of analysis. And all that, all, every one of those involve uh, having students to write uh, stories. Um. My understanding of what you said was that each lesson has one of these food for thought passages, which is both a reading passage and a reflection yes. on part of the grammar. That's correct. Right. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, did you have some problem with, uh, with the some of the vowels and consonants that you cannot uh, transcribe in English, or did you use all kind of alphabet for English? We didn't use all of those English alphabets. Right. We used, I think it's 20, 20, I think. We didn't use all of those. 
And we have two uh, other sounds that uh, we can combine the na and the nya sound that are not present in English. We just combine the two English letters. Yeah. Uh, because it's related to more research, more, more other language in Iran has no writing system. So I'm, I'm thinking of certain things, right? All right, thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Clever McDougall, the University of Western Australia. I know so fully well and I've done some research on this movement. So this is really a response to the question for you to talk about something that I don't think you quite talked about in relation to more resources um, for a program like this. And this is something that people that are part of the KUHU, the other teachers, quote you on a lot, which is money kills work. So I wonder if you could explain to everybody why you've, in over the 20 years of the development of the Kulu language movement, you've said many times, money kills work. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> the, this, in the Solomon Islands, we, we have a lot of assistance from the parliament members, and usually they politicize their their assistance to the people too, so that people who vote for them get uh, get assistance and all that. But we also have, you know, assistance coming in. And usually, uh, words that uh, that move be just because money is there usually uh, don't go any further than the availability of money. And so, we although we 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 still like money, we want money. Uh, we don't want people to to be involved just because they want money. Uh, we need it, uh, but uh, we want people to, to have passion for this work and to do it because it's important in itself. Uh, whether money is available or not, uh, we still like to be able to do it. So we'd like to get that kind of a perspective to those who work with us. And when money is available, we take it. But that's not the reason, we don't want to make that as the, the only reason why we do it. So I guess this is part, partly amplifying an answer to Tikhomim's question, that it, it can be the case of the, the gold killing the goose that lays the egg uh, <laughs> in this uh, situation. So, uh, so, yeah. Hi, um, it's Lita from Western Australia. Um, when you um, have to come up with words for the meta language, um, you have to sort of use concrete concepts to, to uh, coin a word that is more abstract. So I just wonder when translating the Bible, whether there are many concepts that we don't have the equivalent and we have to coin words in a similar way to coin the metadata this question one. And the question two is um, given a very deep meaning of reading means to understand. So in the case of a reading a Bible, would understanding stop at understanding the meaning of the literal meaning of the words, or would it means um, understanding the, the biblical or the deeper meaning? Just wonder whether the the um, the yeah the, the, the meaning of the word reading tied up to understanding means that you have a different conceptual understanding of what Okay, so let me try to answer the first one. Are there times when, in translating the Bible, that I have to re look at uh, different ways to express the concept in the original? Uh, yes, uh, there are many times. Uh, many, there are things that we don't have in the language. Mm -hmm. Animals, for example, which is so uh, so many, uh, and it's it's difficult. We have to use a borrowed word. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are times maybe the concept itself is not there. We try to work around ways to actually express it. Maybe instead of using a word for it, use a phrase or something and try to try to find ways. Even if it's not there, we try to find ways. Okay. The second one I don't think I quite follow. Yeah, I, I guess it's just something in my mind like uh, <coughs> yeah. Um, don't, don't worry too much about this. I just wonder because reading is tied to the meaning of reading in the language, Tiro, the 
this type of understanding. So I just want to if someone say, oh, you know, I read the Bible, or I understood the Bible, do they, would they only say that when they have understand the biblical meaning, or would they say, oh, I read the Bible, I understood the Bible, when they understand the literal meaning of the text? Okay. You, you would hope that when they say they understand it, they actually understand it. So let's let's pass on to it. Right. No, I, I really am curious about this. It's great stuff. It's great stuff. So apologies that I'm holding this microphone. But um, look, I did want to come back to context again. Uh, another question I've got is that um, this is not the first time, of course, that uh, in, in the Western Solomons there's been a vernacular Bible. And, you know, for example, my, uh, my mother-in-law from, from Marabo, she uh, nightly reads her Marabo Bible, which was published in the 1950s. And that's the one she prefers. So it, it has been around before, and it, it does raise the question about you know, what's different about um, the project of the Marabo Bible and the Robiana Bible and, and what you're doing now? Why, why, what are the differences that cause reading uptake? Because you're saying Lunga didn't really catch on and yet you've got people in, in Robiana and, and Marabo who are quite happy reading uh, their Bibles that, that in the Marabo case was published many decades ago. And I do have, uh, 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 well, yeah, let's, let's go with that one. That's, that's a problem. Yeah, but there was a look, can I, can I just ask the second part of that? The, the second thing about literacy context is that, you know, um, my old friend, a, a pig hunter, who went to school in, in the 1950s, he tells me, he only did two years of school because he got tired of it, but he did learn to read and write in Robiana. And it's true, he, he's able to write quite fine in Robiana from his two years of 1950s schooling. So how, how does that also differ from what you're doing? Okay, <clears throat> so my parents grew up writing and speaking Robiana, uh, just because it was the missionary language. And everybody, uh, mostly those who were covered by the Methodist missions, uh, were in with the language. Uh, so everybody knew that. Even up until my time, uh, Robiana was the language, apart from English. So, uh, the, new, the, the younger generations, uh, groups after me, maybe starting from me, Robiana is not, not the language for them, for the Lunga people. So it's either Lunga or Pidgin, in English, but Rovina is something they, they pick up if, if they go to a Rovina area, for example. The older people, so that's true for the older generations, but not the younger ones. Uh, I think Rovina and Marova are all the, they have translations, mission, missions were involved in translating the Bible, so they, they gain a status much earlier than these other languages. I think this is probably a good point to draw things to close. Yeah. There, there may be more questions, but uh, offices are around through the week, and so seek them out to, okay. to ask them. Uh, and now please join me in applauding Alphys for a wonderful <laughs>